Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Commute Talk. Today, I thought I would talk a little bit about security in the Serenity operating system and uh, just uh, share some observations that I've made in the last three weeks or so that I've been learning about security and just getting, giving myself a crash course in, in all of this. Because it's something that I've been kind of staying away from or not being super interested in in the past until now. So anyway, uh, just just some thoughts about this. So uh, the first thing that I realized after seeing the first exploit is that validation is everything. Like you gotta validate your inputs. And the Serenity kernel made a very half-assed attempt to validate syscall inputs, and that ended up um, ended up screwing us because. <laughs> This stuff was not well tested, and um, it was it was more about catching badly behaving user space programs than it was protecting the kernel. And um, the first exploit that I saw, it um, <laughs> it took advantage of the fact that uh, the kernel validates syscall pointer inputs, but if you gave it a valid kernel pointer, it would say, "Yeah, that's a valid pointer." Um, so it, it didn't care that it was a kernel pointer. Um, so that sort of thing is something that needs, like, you just need to be checking your inputs. And um, the second thing is that CPUs have tons of great hardware protection features, and most of them, you can just turn them on. And they will just work out of the box if you have a sound design and that's what I ended up doing with a lot of CPU features so I've enabled um, SMAP so the supervisor mode access prevention and the supervisor mode execution prevention and um, user mode instruction prevention and the no execute bit the write protect bit and um, protecting the um, timestamp counter in the CPU now, so you can't use that from user space. Um, and just various kinds of um, CPU protections, like all of the things that were just sitting there in the CPU, just waiting to be turned on, um, they're now on, and they just disable um, a whole bunch of attacks that were previously trivial, like um, like the first exploit that I saw from Fire30, it um, it tricked the kernel to into jumping to an arbitrary user space pointer where the exploit had a payload or um, it had like a little shell code, and um, that that was just so silly that you could get the kernel to jump to user space, so. That's something that SMEP, or Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention, um, just disallows that. And if, if the kernel is trying to jump to user space, it will just crash the current thread. And now that's enabled, and that's, that's a really good thing. And, and um, I'm happy that I've been able to turn on most of these things. And there are still some things I need to look at, but all of the easy and medium difficulty ones are enabled now. Uh, and then another observation is that uh, time of check, time of use bugs are very exploitable. So um, the second exploit that I saw, it, um, it used a vulnerability in the, I think it was NanoSleep syscall, where um, NanoSleep is supposed to tell you if, if it wakes up before the sleep time runs out, then it's supposed to tell you how much time was remaining in the sleep when it fails. So if you interrupt the process that's nano sleeping, it will give you back the e-inter interrupted syscall error, and it will also like write out the amount of remaining time to a struct. And um, we were validating that struct pointer, and then uh, we would go to sleep, and then we would wake up again and write to that pointer. And there was an extra interaction there, and 
that meant that uh, we were writing a number to a user space controlled pointer after a sleep. So there was plenty of time while the process was sleeping to, to change that pointer from a second thread. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, so, so I've been like scouting around for those kind of bugs, like time of check, time of use, race conditions. And I have to say they're a little bit harder to find than the, like, the obvious validation errors. And there are probably, probably various um, bugs in this class lying around in the tree and it's something I need to look for and find more of. Um, there's an ambulance behind me. Uh, I have to make sure that I make space for him. So I'm just going to park on the side of the road here so that he can go past. All right. Here we go. Um, so <laughs> what was I saying? Time of check, time of use. Yeah, so probably more of those bugs hiding need to, need to be found. And need to think about some some good like patterns to help avoid those kind of bugs in the first place um, like moving validation to the latest possible point things like that um, and okay so another observation I have is that um, it's not usually not enough with one bug and this is something I found really fascinating that once the system has some defenses up and you know, like the basic um, hardware mechanisms that I mentioned and stuff, and it's just validating things, um, then it's often it's not enough just because you find one bug where you can trick the system into doing one little thing. Um, you have to combine that bug with other bugs to achieve um, like exploitation, right? Or I don't know if, if that's the right term, but like to, to get something like privilege escalation, you might have to do multiple bugs working in tandem and I had not realized this before. I tried to do exploits myself. That um, that you might you might find a bug that allows you to read arbitrary memory or write arbitrary memory, but um, you might need both to succeed in escalating your privileges. And yeah, so I guess I guess that's where that leads me to the. Next observation, which is, which is that uh, mitigations are really cool because it, I don't, it, it doesn't seem to me like there's any silver bullet anywhere on the horizon that's going to fix all of these problems, right? So um, designing your software in such a way that even if a bug is found and you're able to exploit it somewhat, then you, you can try to limit the, um, the power of that that exploit has. Um, so even though even though someone can gain read access, then uh, maybe they can't do anything with it because you have limited the amount of memory that they can read in some other way, or uh, maybe some process gains file system access, and it's not a huge deal because you have already like limited their file system to like a tiny sliver of the system, something, things like that, you know? And um, this, this uh, philosophy of reducing the attack surface and um, reducing the, um, the available things to a, a, a compromised process, I find that, that it's really cool to me. And it's been really interesting to implement the pledge and now also unveil syscalls from OpenBSD because that's what these things are about, right? Like, even if you can compromise the process, then uh, you're still very limited in what you can achieve even though you have control of the execution of that process. Uh, I think uh, that's, that's just really neat. Um, and I guess another thing I would say I've observed is that uh, randomization is seems really neat. <laughs> Serenity doesn't have proper randomization yet, 
but I've noticed that if everything's always showing up in the same freaking address, it just trivializes many things. Um, if uh, the address space layout of the kernel is always the same, so you can just like look at your local copy of the kernel and see like, oh, well, this is where the process table is, and, and I just need to walk from there and then find my process and change the UID to zero, and then it's all good. That sort of thing uh, is uh, not very good. So I definitely would like to do uh, more randomization. And uh, in my own exploits, I, I kept using the fact that um, memory mappings in a process would always show up in the same place. And it was just so convenient that you could just offset. And you would know where the base was. You could always offset reliably from the base of the executable when you would exploit the program loader. And, you know, that, that bothered me so much that I went and I added a little bit of randomization to it. So now um, process address space always starts with a random offset up to 32 megabytes. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect and it's not proper ASLR, but at least it disables this um, silly exploits that, that I was able to trivially make. And I guess I, I think that's sort of what this whole thing is about, right? Like, it's about stacking all of these different uh, annoyances and uh, things that together um, hopefully overlap to such a degree that they block out exploitation. Because, like, one, just like you can't just achieve um, esca privilege escalation with a single bug, often you can't achieve full protection with a single um, mitigation or a single defense mechanism. You need all, all the different ones to be working together. And maybe this is really newbie uh, entry level observations, but I'm, I'm newbie and entry level here, so bear with me. Uh, this, but it is interesting, and it's, it's, I've been trying to take a very disciplined approach about this. So like, I go and I look for bugs, and um, I try to exploit them, and then I fix the bug, and um, I try to fix it systematically if possible, or if I, if I know how. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that remains to be done. And yeah, a lot of work. But it's been fun so far. Although I will say that it is really draining, this type of work. Because uh, I guess a, a lot of the time you feel like, or I feel like, I'm just sitting there hunting and I'm not being super productive. I'm just like auditing, basically, looking for um, mistakes. And um, it makes me feel like a little bit bad about how I'm spending my time. But it is fun. Um, but I don't think I will be doing quite as much of this as I've been lately uh, going forward. But uh, I'm glad that, that I've spent some time on it and learned a bunch of things already. And I'm not going to stop doing it either. But um, it just it doesn't feel completely productive all of the time, which I guess I would enjoy being. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, I'm arriving at work here, so i got to wrap it up. Um, but, yeah, these are my, uh, my entry-level observations, uh, my newbie observations about security. And going forward, I'm definitely going to keep, keep an eye on this type of stuff and try to um, keep building the system with security in mind from now on. And I hope that, that we can... We can make something nice here. Um, and I, I guess I should mention that I'm really happy with C++ because I've been looking at um, sort of vulnerability reports about, about regarding like other kernels and other systems. And um, a lot of the problems that people are seeing in other systems are essentially um, not happening because of smart pointers and that's a really nice thing so you know yay C++ but 
Uh, I don't want to get comfortable at thinking that the language is going to save me because um, got to be vigilant. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just going to go to work. So um, thank you for listening to this little observation roundup. And um, let's, uh, let's stay proactively secure out there. See you next time. <laughs>